Welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy, and take note of Hailu Mergia. He is a master accordionist, a veteran band leader, a ranger, and keyboardist, originally from Ethiopia. He became famous in his homeland in the 1970s, playing in a group called Wallius Band. In the way that the music scene was in the city of Addis Ababa, the premier place to play was the Hilton Hotel, where Wallius Band had a residency for years. And because of his love for music, the story goes that Hailu would also sneak over to the Gion Hotel, which was basically the second best place to play in Addis Ababa, and there he would sit in with the Dalek Band, a group of younger musicians. So in the mid-70s, big political change came to Ethiopia when Emperor Haile Selassie was overthrown by the Provisional Military Administrative Council, also known as the Derg. And one of the many, many restrictive rules that the Derg imposed was a curfew from midnight to 6 a.m. where people had to stay off the streets. Well, Wallius Band kept them off the streets, all right. The solution? They would play music from midnight to six and keep them dancing all night. So building upon their success in Ethiopia, which happened in spite of the bloody regime of the Derg, Wallius Band toured the United States at the dawn of the 1980s. And once in the US, Hailu Mergia and a few of his fellow band members decided it was time to defect. Since the agreement wasn't unanimous though, the band split up. Hailu did some solo recordings, then he opened a restaurant, and when that didn't take off like he'd hoped it would, he ended up driving a cab for years in Washington, D.C. And while he didn't perform for several years, he always kept a keyboard in his trunk and would practice in between fares to Dulles Airport. And he did this for several years until 2013, when Brian Shimkovitz, a DJ, blogger, and label owner, Check out awesome tapes from Africa, by the way, if you haven't already. So Brian Shimkovitz contacted Hailu Mergia because when he was in Ethiopia digging in crates of a record store, he found the tape that Hailu Mergia had made while inside the U.S. And luckily, Hailu Mergia is a highly Googleable name. So he contacted him and asked if he could re-release his music. Not only did Hailu agree, but he started playing again and recording new music. But let's go back to the beginning of the story for Hailu, who was always interested in music from the start. Let's let him tell you all about it. Well, you know, when I was a kid, I, I used to try to play Ethiopian, uh, they call it masinko, like uh, one string uh, uh, violin. Uh, it looks like that. So I used to play like, you know, I was not good, but, you know, I was acting like uh, I'm, I'm playing the Latin instrument. And uh, so from then on, uh, you know, like um, uh, I was try, trying to uh, to sing some songs that I know back then, uh, which I don't remember now. That's what I, I was uh, trying to do at the first place. And, and did you have siblings growing up? Oh, yeah. Uh, I used to have uh, uh, brothers and sisters. And did they play music also? No, no, none of them. Yeah. Did you always know that you wanted to do music for a living? Well, you know, I, I, yeah, as a kid, I, I just want to play uh, music around when uh, uh, I have a chance. And uh, I used to go to like um, uh, sing for a performance. In, uh, by any chance, if I have any uh, things, otherwise I was not really uh, lo- looking for that. But I was I have interest, but you know, I was not really into it. And so then you, so what year were you born? I born in nineteen forty six. Okay. And how long were you? You grew up. What's the name of the place? Sh- Shawa Province. Yeah, Shawa Province, which is a, uh, which is a famous. Uh, uh, province in Ethiopia because the capital city is there and almost everything is right there at the corner of the area. You know, that's where I grew up. Right. And how long before you moved to Addis Ababa? Well, I moved like uh, maybe like 70 years. I'm, I'm not sure I mean, exactly when I left. 
when uh, but I know that when I was uh, when I uh, left to Addis, I was uh, eleven years old. You so your family moved all together. It wasn't you just heading into the big city to try and make it in music. No, I, I moved with them with my my, my uh, mother. So when did you start playing with other people? When uh, I start playing music, uh, like uh, professionally, when I was uh, 19 years old. But before that, the, I, I used to play like uh, I, I was in army, like for as a boy scout. And then, you know, I was uh, I play I, I play there about two years. And then after that, I, I left the army, and then I start playing in uh, clubs. And so the the first instrument, your first instrument was accordion, right? Yeah, but before that, I was I, I was a singer. The accordion starts after after a while, but of course that's my first instrument. Did did you take lessons or just figure it out on your own? No, I I, I took a lesson in, in, when I was in army, but I was not good, and I left before I finished the school. So after that, everything was like. From listening and uh, just playing. Yeah. When when did you really figure out that this was something you wanted to do a lot more of? When I was like uh, about uh, twenty one. So what what was it that made you say, okay, this is this is the time, this is the thing for me? Uh, when I start playing a little bit better from uh, in the club because. It's almost like a challenging time because I have to run from one place to another place. I never had like um, like regular places. I don't remember exactly the, t- the time, but uh, I know I start somewhere in, uh, in the, uh, somewhere in sixty eight. Was the Wallace Band your first band that you joined? Yes, my my first band before, like I said before, uh, you know everything like is running from. From place to place, but this time, that was in 1962. We formed the band called Wallace Band. Before that, I was playing in the same club sometimes, on and off. So I started really performing in 1962. And and where where did you meet these guys? Uh, we met in a club called Zula Zula Club, which is uh, like nice nice club, but. Uh, uh, like you know, it's not very famous when we started, but you know, we can, uh, for, uh, and then after a while, we became very famous. You know. So you're playing with these guys, and when you start playing, uh, Haile Selassie is still the leader of Ethiopia, right? Yes. How much? I mean, I I only know the facts of how it changed, and and with with the ruling of the the Derg, but. Tell me a little bit about what was going on before that happened. Uh, as a uh, music player, we were traveling and playing different places and different uh, uh, clubs. And also, finally, we ended up playing in a Hilton Hotel. Okay, so when we get to Hilton Hotel, after, uh, I think, after uh, maybe two years or something, exactly, I don't know exactly the time, then Doug came. So still we were playing in the Hilton Hotel back then. But before the Derg came, were, were you still doing the midnight to six? Or was that just because of the Derg that that time restriction happened? Oh, you mean the playing? Yeah. I you know, we were playing almost every day, like seven days a week sometimes. We were playing in a club and, and, uh, for different occasions. So I remember all that stuff. But... Uh, you know, we became a very regular musician in 19 in Hilton Hotel. I think that's so interesting that the, the hotels were where it was at. And I, I just find it fascinating, the whole part about the Derg, where people would have to be in the club from midnight to six because of the curfew. Did, did, uh, was that something that was a challenge to adjust to, just playing those hours and keeping those hours? There are two things I have to mention to you. To you. Like, um, first we start playing in Hilton Hotel. Like, we start playing performing like uh, from seven o'clock until like until midnight. And then, because we have different kind of uh, 
performance. So after that, the Dirk, when the Dirk came, you know, there, is, there was a request from the public if we can uh, stay like um, until um, curfew is passed. When that comes, so we start playing from like from 10 o'clock, we start performing until like five o'clock in the morning. That's how we used to do. So there, are, so there was time for shifting from uh, one club to another performance. But uh, we play at the same place. The difference was that that we have. Tell me about what what it was like in in the club from those hours. The, you mean the audience or what? Yeah, the audience, the atmosphere. I imagine mm-hmm. it's just. I just imagine a really sweaty, exciting, fun time where you know you're just listening to this music and moving to it uh while the derg is outside you know making sure you're inside when we start playing in hilton hotel as long as as long as we are are in in premises i mean we don't have problem uh, problem because because the because of the name hilton Hilton hotel everything we are like uh, international musicians as uh, as long as we stay inside the club, but you know uh, when we go out to uh, outside the club, sometimes there is kind of uh, differences between comments or something like that. But when we play there, we we are per- per- performing like we start like um like seven o'clock, and then we play different music until the music before the dinner music finished. So we have dinner music from uh, 7 o'clock until 10 o'clock. And then f- from 10 o'clock, we start playing a regular p- program. And then by midnight, we finish the whole, the whole thing. You know, playing from midnight to 5 a.m. I'd imagine, do, do, do you feel like your the way you played music changed during those years at all? Yeah, well, we we'll always have a ch- uh, music change. Because we we have to practice every day, so we are almost uh, playing any kind of music back then. So because of the audience, the audience always they ask us, you know, the, any kind of music that they listen, new music or something like that. So we play a lot of different music. It was very interesting to do that kind of music. Even sometimes we don't know when the time is over. We have very latest music. Back then, how, how many nights a week? One well, uh, from Friday from uh, from f- uh, Sunday to Sunday is like, like we have only okay. Let me put it. We have only t- two shows that we play until about six o'clock. Six o'clock in the morning, which is uh, from f- uh, s- Saturday until uh, the time is over. All right, so it wasn't every every night of the week you were doing that schedule. No, we we, we have a schedule to play almost every day. You know, from every day, the only time we play long hours is like uh, from um, Friday to Saturday because of the curfew. The audience is like we have two kind of audience. Like um, the first show, like until to, uh, twelve uh, twelve o'clock, almost everybody's there. But after when the curfew comes, everybody have to move out, and the other guys, the other guys who are supposed to stay until five o'clock, they they come and join us. When do you meet the the people in the Dalek band, and how did that come about that you were playing in two bands at the same time? Well, Wallace band came. Uh, we were playing there almost every day, like like I said. But you know, we were not doing any kind of recording until. Uh, until uh, like uh, for a while, the Wallace band like started recording somewhere in the seventies. Uh, uh, before that, you know, we were doing some kind of like recording, but we were not really professional. I mean, we don't we don't play regular time. Right, and, and so then, so the the people from the Dalek band, where where do they come in then? The Wallace band, like people, they come from everywhere. The audience comes everywhere. We have a very mixed crowd, and everybody's coming from different places. Okay, so, but are the members of the Dalek band different from Wallace band? Those guys are, um, they are a different group. They are second group, like, 
it's almost like we play together every uh, different places. So the Halak band is like another another band. The the story I always heard was that you were playing with the Walias band, the Hilton, and that that was the place to play. But then the Dalek band was at a different hotel, and you would just kind of sneak over there. I don't I don't know how much truth there is to that though. Every one of the uh, us we we start having like a recording. So my first uh, record with Dan, the Halak band was you know, since 1970, 1970s. So I did only recording. It's not like, I, I did the recording with, 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 with the Dahlak band because um, uh, there was a time that I have to do diff- different kind of sound with from Wallace band. So that's how I did this, this recording. So the band is not like, uh, the band is different band. It's not like, a regular Dalek band. They, and they were younger guys too, right? Oh, well, yeah, younger guys, but you know, you know, everybody, the, we almost say to, uh, for, for us, like, we're calling, we are calling, called ourselves young anyway. But I know there, are, there is some kind of difference between us and between them. I remember also reading somewhere that you just thought it was better to, write instrumental music because there would be too much censorship if you, you tried to put words to the songs. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's one reason. But, you know, the other part is what I did decide was to play only in strong, in instrumental pieces uh, because, like you said, uh, there are some kind of a censorship in this, or do this, don't, don't do that. So instead of going to that, I prefer doing that uh, and instrumental uh, pieces. So, uh, at the same time, we're doing also like uh, with the uh, other member ba- member of the band. Uh, we used to do some kind of recording too. So I was doing two kind of things. One, I do like uh, an instrumental pieces recording. Two, I, I was doing also performing with the uh, with the Wallace band. So I was doing two two kind of uh, music. With the government being what it was at the time, and, and I know you eventually defected, but how much pressure was there on you during this time from the government? Oh, yeah, for the government, of course, we have a lot of pressures because sometimes they, you don't allow to play anything what you want. Uh, so you have to stop playing that kind of music, like especially with a, with a singer, because there is a, a, a censorship that you, do, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. So there is a pressure, you know, everything like, they will ask you like to do some kind of uh, patriarchy, uh, patriarchy music. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very hard to deal with that kind of stuff. But anyway, there was the, still, uh, as long as we perform with an instrumental, sometimes we just play that kind of stuff. But there was, of course, a pressure from the government. You, because you don't have a freedom of to do the music what you want. Sometimes they call you, you are no good. or you know, There are so many things what's going on back then. But anyway, we were doing fine. Would you have made music differently if there was no Derg? Yeah, we would have. It's, it's true. How would you have approached it if if there was not the Derg? If there were, there were no Derg, because before that we were playing different, differently, because you know, uh, performing everywhere, everywhere, and, uh, and nobody would say something to you, or uh, nobody would force you to do this, to do that. So it, it was very different. Yeah, was it was it like a quick overnight thing, or was it a gradual crackdown? Uh, no, it's a overnight crackdown. They, because once they said you don't have to do this, you, have, you don't have to do it. That's it. If you could talk a little bit about just because I don't know that much about it, uh, I only know from what I've read from uh, books about Rastafarian performers and musician. Uh, Haile Selassie, were you uh, a supporter of his? Was he, you know, somebody that you and your uh, bandmates admired, or were you? What was 
your feeling when he was ousted from power? And, uh, I was not ha- happy, really. Especially after I saw what's going on after the coup d'etat. I, I don't want to stay there because the whole thing was what's going on there. It was scary. Things was going very wrongly. You know, sometimes they kill people on the street. You don't know who's going to come in after you. And who, you don't know who's going to kill you either. So it was a scary uh, time. It's very hard to explain to you. I know it was not a good time. And, and did, did you lose any friends in in the Red Terror? Oh, of course, definitely. Many. Very close friends, you know. Oh, it's, it just, it's very hard to remember that time. Yeah, I'd, I'd imagine. So I, I'm guessing was that what made you say you had to leave and, and to defect? Yes, because, you know, because of the situation was not good. So at the same time, we got like an um, opportunity to come up here as a group. That was a good reason to, to come up here. It was, uh, we had a good opening time because we don't want to deal with that kind of life. And, and so the initial plan was a, a tour of the United States, right? Yes. And, and how many dates did you end up performing? Well, we're performing almost um, every weekend. In the U.S.? Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. We, we, have, we traveled, I don't know, many states. It was good. Yeah, what, what kind of places were you playing? We're playing like uh, sometimes local uh, clubs, sometimes like um, theater house. Mm-hmm. It depends on what, what kind of uh, gig we, we got. And, and did you know right from the start that when you came to the States, you would not be going back? No, the first, the first time we didn't, we didn't uh, decide. That comes after the, the, the show was over. And then after the show was over, now we have to uh, make a decision. Who's going to stay here and who's going to stay, go back home. So th- that comes after, after the end of the show. Uh, at the end of the tours in America? Yes. How did that conversation go with your band's bandmates? There was kind of a division, uh, di- uh, di- 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 divided things between uh, the member of the band. The majority of us, uh, as we said, we have to stay here. And then we split in, uh, as a group. So some of them want to go home, some of them want to stay here. That's how we, we decide. So you stay here. Was, th- was there a breakup of the Walias band? Yeah, there was a breakup because um, we have to make another band. For a while, we were not playing um, in a club. You and three other band members stay, right? You know, there was, uh, there was a, a group who, who played for, uh, for almost every night. Those guys, some of them, some of them, I, I, I joined them, as you know, sometimes, sometimes some of them playing together. We start performing as a band called Zula Band. That's, that's how we start performing as a band. And then, so you're doing that in the States for a while, and then at some point, you, you record, right? You record at Howard University. No, the... It's not in Howard University. It's, it's, uh, there was a guy who used to play in um, Howard U- University. I met that guy. Uh, we started recording. That's how I, uh, we started. That was that music was like um, one band, one man band. That's why we started doing the, the music. And, and what made you do that on your own rather than play with members of the Zula band? This is the story. This uh, when I went to the studio. There was um, a show we, we used to do like um, as a team from Wallace Band. We used to play accordion. It's almost like um, playing different kind of music for like a break, break time. I used to play accordion with a singer. When uh, the band finished the whole thing, that was when we played with the Wallace Band. Then when the Wallace Band break up, and then I went to back to the accordion section because I, I want to do some kind of recording, you know, like for for the memory of like, I might think of like, I might not go back to accordion. There was a guy who gave me accordion for a, for a while. And then 
I start recording just for the, the, the memory. And then after I did about two songs, because this guy, the guy who is the owner of the studio, he used to have Rhodes piano and accordion and a synthesizer, a mini synthesizer. I went to his studio. I just want to do about two songs or something like that. And then I end up finishing doing about 10 songs. That's how I started doing that. So that was like, uh, I like the way, uh, the, the way how I, I was performing or when I do the recording in the studio. So we just keep on doing it differently in different uh, kind of rhythm. So I end up finishing the whole songs at one time. So uh, that song became very popular in Ethiopia. That's how it starts. Uh, I started that music. So it was like one man band. And, and how did that music get back to Ethiopia? There was a guy who used to have a studio. Now he passed away about maybe two weeks ago. Oh, sorry. I sent the music, that, that music for to re, uh, release it. That's how it happened. And, and were you in contact with him? Did he know you were making this album? and uh, Or did you just send it to him and say, hey, do you want to do this? Or I just um, asked him, can you... Do you want to do this? And he said, okay. So we make a, a deal. That's how we started it. But it ended up like that, that music be, became like very popular. And here, everywhere. Even it's, still now, it's very popular. Yeah, I love it. I don't know how I did it, but it, <laughs> I did it good. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, so when you were in Ethiopia, you, you were famous in your country. Yes. And so there was a demand for the music back there what was it like to be in america and not be as famous the Ethiopian music back then was not popular honestly i mean everybody listened his kind of music or i don't know it could be like the recording or something like that it was not like very famous in here in america that was one reason it has to go to also with uh, uh, with the population we don't have that many Ethiopians back then. We don't play that much. That's what is the, I think that's what is the reason I know. Otherwise, uh, now when I look at it, now Ethiopian music is very different from what I know. That's the reason I, I think I remember, I remember it. Otherwise, there was no like uh, performance back then. Yeah, I mean, it was just the hotels, right? Yeah, hotels and uh, small clubs. Sometimes... Uh, it's a very popular place you go play. Sometimes you don't. That's what it, it is. There was not a, no reason to avoid Ethiopian music, but you know we don't have enough uh, popular people uh, to come up to the club. So, are you saying like fame in Ethiopia is different than fame in America? I guess. Oh, you mean the difference? Yeah, I mean, well, just like what it means to be a popular musician. Popular musician means like. Um, like when you became popular every time when you play everywhere, when everybody admires you, it's like you are, you are popular uh, to, to my sense. Here's the way it was not popular means back then. We don't have enough uh, crowd like we have in, in Ethiopia. You release this cassette and it's, it's really popular. And then you keep playing to an extent. Have you, have you started driving the cab yet? What, when did that begin? That began in um, 1991, and then in 1991, I just stopped playing with in a club. I don't I have no any reason. Yeah, it wasn't that you were sick of it, or no, I was not sick. I, I just, I just want to quit for a while. Mm. But I still was practicing at home, so that was the difference. Is so I stayed like that maybe like until uh, 2013. Also, almost uh, 20 years, but, but still practicing, doing this, uh, some little recordings. That's how I stayed. And, but there, there was a restaurant in between too, right? Yeah, there was a restaurant. Uh, then what I did was, when uh, I quit in 1991, there was a club called uh, Sukus Club, which is an African club. Me and my friends, we, we opened a club on Georgia Avenue. Right there, I, I decided to to be a manager or to play part of the the group because because we were three guys 
me and Tom, uh, bass player and one guy, a drummer. That's how we start, we start, and we start playing, playing in, in clubs. It's, that place cool. Like the member of the band was Tamru Ayele and uh, Muga Sabte, which plays uh, saxophone and uh, a drum machine. Yeah, Mo- Moga Sabte is from the Zula band, right? Yes, yes, yeah. from the band. Still, our friends anyway. That's how we started you know, that club. And then after that, you know, I told. I just quit playing and uh, I started being a manager with them on a club. So but how was uh, your musical life different during this time w- when you were practicing at home and when you were driving the cab and then practicing in between cab fares? Did did you approach music any differently than you did when you were gigging? No, I, I was just doing the same thing, like you said. I wasn't doing anything, but... There is no gig, uh, nothing going on, uh, you know, as 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 far as we're concerned. During this whole time, were you itching to play? Was was there? It was a, like a itch you couldn't scratch, or, or didn't? Did you not care if you ever played again in in public? Well, I almost like I can I can say I don't care. You know why? Because as long as I have, I, I practice, I don't feel nothing. I just Maybe I have, of course, uh, I might have, of course, I have some kind of feeling. One day I might, I might go back to music, but I wasn't sure about it. That's why I was keep on practicing. That was a, a kind of like a suspicious time for me. If there is happen, I might do it. So you could get the same satisfaction of just playing just for yourself that you could from playing for other people? Yeah, I can, yes, you can say that. So, but tell me about uh, your, your relationship with, with Brian Shimkowitz. The, the story I know is that he discovered that cassette we were talking about, the, the one uh, that you recorded on your own, Hailu Mergia and his classical instrument. He found it in Africa and then contacted you in the U.S., right? Yes. And just wanted to release it more broadly. And, the, and that's the story, right? Mm-hmm. So, so when he contacts you, you know, what, what are you doing? Are, are you getting emails at that address frequently? Or is this just one out of the blue? Well, you know, the first time uh, I get an email from him while I was driving a taxi, he just contacted me and he asked me, you know, to release, to release the, the music, the, the one uh, he said. I just, for the first, my question was, how do you find my address? He told me the whole story. Because I, I you know, I forgot even that I had a, my, my phone on a, my email. So that's how we, I contacted him. Everything, we discussed about it. He likes the music and uh, she asked me to send him a cover of the album. A lot of, a bunch of like uh, albums. She likes uh, cassettes. I have to find out which one, uh, which one we are talking about. So that's how we, uh, we started the business. What was your reaction? Uh, one of, oh, this is the one you want to release? Great. I also have this one. I also have this one. Or how did the relationship continue to be as such that all of the those old releases from dating back from the 70s would be things that uh, awesome tapes from Africa would put out. Yeah, so like I said, you know, the first uh, uh, album was done, and then after that, you know, we start continuing. Put one be will be the next one, and this and that. That's what uh, our uh, relationship is good at the same time. And you know, w- w- everything we discussed about it, how before it re- released. So I think that's what is it, that's what it is. How does it feel knowing that this music you made so long ago is is finding a new audience? Did did you ever think it would again? You know, the audience is like I was surprised the first time when I have a, the first show because of, there are two things. What I was surprised one, I was uh, I have a, a new crowd which is the American crowd, and of course. Uh, 
there are some kid, people also who's, who come for, to the show. So the audience was like, I never had a show before like that. I, I was wishing to have this kind of show, so I was really excited about about it. Still, I, I still I excited about the show what I had. The first thing that what I was questioning myself was how could it could it happen like when I when I see this kind of crowd, the the reaction, the the, the, the for your surprise, the first show was my real excitement time because I I never played for a crowd with such crowd with the mass crowd and uh, for my own show and two the the show was like was trio so that was really i still couldn't believe it the way how it happened so as somebody who's part of this audience who's discovering you later there's something that resonates in me in the music. It's just there. It's there's a there's a tranquility, a peacefulness about it, and the fact that it's instrumental. I don't know what your the the songs are about. Um, so if you could, I, I have a few song titles. I'd, I'm just wondering what what they mean, and and I'm gonna probably mispronounce them. What is uh, Anchin Kafayankash? Uh, yeah, Anchin Kafayankash. What, yeah. What's that mean? Oh, uh, well, it's hard to, uh, to explain it. Like, I know that's how bad things happen to you. That's it's almost like that. Because like, when you love somebody, you always think of good things for that person. I don't want to, I don't want to wish you to happen to you. The person who sings that song, he was, he was really have a good attachment with that person. Nobody's going to touch that person. That's what, uh, uh, you know, meaning, to me is the meaning. So you don't wish for somebody you love, bad things. That's what it does, it does mean. Because, you know, some uh, translation to Amharic to English is kind of a little bit uh, different, the way how you explain it. But I know that uh, it's, it's almost you, you are protecting your, uh, your friend from nothing happened to her like bad things. How about y- Yikerta Lemanelehu? Yikerta Lemanelehu is like, um, I'm, give, I'm asking you like uh, forgiveness. Give me your excuse. I don't want to repeat it, that again. So I want you to give me your uh, excuses. Um, how about Sunetua? Your body. Sunetua means um, the way how you look at you, your friend, how you love to, you love to see her. The way how she is beautiful, like you explain, you are trying to explain that like your body is like the one I prefer. I like your style. I like your kind of any kind of things that you that you see from that person. And and then the last one I wanted to ask about is uh musicawi silt. Musicawi silt is that is like um, a style of music. That you create for that uh, music. It's it's like music. I felt is like um, like a, a technique of the music that you, you you play. It's a technique of the music because when you listen to the music, it's like uh, the scale is it's different from the pentatonic scale. So that's what that's what I'm trying to explain. The music is different from what we were playing back then. That's what that's what it is. Now, did were you the the main composer of all the Walia Span songs? No, not really. I I, I don't comp- uh, Actually, I start composing like uh, most of the music. What I was playing was like uh, redo it, change the uh, the music speed. I I pick up like a song, an old songs, and just do it a different way. That's what I was doing, but I, I did it. I was not really a composer, but now, now of course, I'm composing my own stuff from seventies. It, it was not too much, but I, I have now a lot of songs to, to create. The first thing is like I was doing some kind of music to adapt to the music with the, with the crowd. Like instead of playing some music again and again with the with a singer, it's better you you, you do it in, in, with instrumental. Yeah, that's how I was doing. 
we mentioned Music How We Still, and, and that's one of the songs that I think Walia's band is known for the most around here, and there are lots of different versions of that by other groups. Uh, have you listened to all those? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was, that was my favorite songs, too. That was that music was composed by Guruma Bayena, who who used to play piano. Because that guy is very, I mean, a very good composer. I still wonder how it became so very popular until now. A lot of nice music, and uh, we all love it when we listen to that music. Yeah, has uh, and, and Guruma Bay- uh, Bayam was uh, he was in the the Zula band as well, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, and he, he defected with you as well, right? Yes. And do, do you stay in touch? Oh, yeah. We have been friends for a long time, for a very long time. We still are friends. Uh, now he lives in Addis, but we are, I still call, call him, and sometimes he calls me too. Yeah, that's great. And are you still driving the cab as well? No, I I, st- I stopped uh, driving cab about two years ago. Is it because of that that you're finally able to make enough money to make a living from the music? Uh, that is one uh, reason, but uh, most of my reason is uh, because of Uber or this uh, private business. Our business was uh, very slow. I could I couldn't make uh, money like I used to do. It's better to to have uh, one profession. It doesn't matter how how much I make money, but at the same time, when I look at it now, the show business is getting much better. So I said, well, it's better to quit and stop in one in a kind of one one business. And at the same time, I drove the taxi for a long time. So this is about time to, to quit. Right. And, and tell me a little bit about the, the album you put out last year, uh, Yene Mercha, is that how I say it? Yes. So where did you find these players? The, the players are the, the, still, I, I have my trio, which is Alam Sagar and uh, Ken, the drummer. So we still have the, the, the trio. Uh, the, the saxophone player is Munga Safti. The way I, I did with this album was like this kind of uh, arrangement. So that's how I started doing it. But so I think this is a whole story about it. Uh, when I start composing this song, I just uh, want to have different kind of sound. More solo parts in a, on a recording, and uh, the choir part is there. It's kind of like mixed kind of uh, music. So the, uh, the title is Yenemircha means my choice. It's really my, uh, that's my choice. I mean, I believe in that. So that's how I, I did it. And, and to me, it's a kind of different kind of sound that we have. Yeah, I can, it's definitely different, but I can still hear the sound that kind of was your signature in, in the 1970s music. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's, that, that's how the, the, the main reason also for this album. You, you, you're right. I'm trying to touch from every kind of music I used to, that I used to play. Like on uh, my choice, when you listen to that groovy sound, kind of groovy sound, with horn, with a guitar solo, all that kind of sounds, it, might, it looks like you are going back to the old songs, like old style music. When you go to the other parts, there is a, also there is a, there is a Masinko part, which is Ethiopian traditional music. So when you listen there, also there is a there is sound you have. You can listen like a Tepian traditional song. So it's, it's a mixed mix kind of sound I have. I'm trying to do, to create it there. What What do you look for in in the people that you play with? Well, I'm, what I'm looking is like many more improvisation, different kind of music, which is like like the the one I I, I explained to you. Like it's it's a kind of Mixed crowd, uh, mixed music, or a mixed crowd. I want to, I want to listen in the future. But right now, I didn't start anything. But that's how I do it. My thing is like, I want to do some kind of different kind of music every time, because I don't want to play, play the same thing again and again. 
you understand me, right? Oh yeah, definitely. You bring breathe new life into a song each time you do it. So, what um, are you uh, eager to get back to playing for people? Oh, I'm 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 really eager to 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 play that because I'm so I'm not really happy now because I don't I don't perform. I I want to I wish I want to go back to the business again. I don't know when it's gonna be, but there is life also in other places. But you know, that's my wish. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard a quote that you had said in a different interview about you know I don't feel good if I don't play music. Yes. You know, the, the, there is a wish. There is a you like it or not. Once you are in a music business, you just uh, want to do it again and again because the, you always miss the crowd. It's a different crowd. You go from one place to another place, so you don't get bored. The, at the same time, the show is not like a long hour show like we used to do in a, in a back then. So everything. Every time you, when you want to listen to music, like you wish you can go every day, every time when you play. So that's all what I'm saying. You know, it's a kind of, um, there is a missing pro, pro, uh, things you, you are looking for. When you miss something, you always want to do it. You always, Wish wish to do it more and more. Hi, Lou Mergia. What a story. It was an honor just to speak with him. And really, if you have not checked out his music, I highly encourage you to do so. It's something special. I also highly encourage you to take a Berkeley online course if you haven't done that before. And because you listen to this podcast, you will receive $100 off your first course. All you got to do... Go to musicismylifepod.com. You'll find all the info you need there. This episode was edited by Talia Smith, mastered by Jose David Vindis Mora. All visual assets coordinated by Mike DeBenedictus. Social media by Brooke Larson. Web assistance comes from Joe McDonough, Steve Zimmerman, and Mark Thomas. Thanks to our video team who posts these episodes on YouTube two weeks after they have premiered on other platforms. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song, but the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. Special thanks to Gabriel Reifer Cohen, Ashley Pointer, Avery Lee, Brian Chimkovitz for all his help coordinating this interview. And thanks to you for listening. Take note to join us on May 17th. Stay safe, listeners, and stay inspired. <laughs>